Welcome back everyone to TNO. I'm your host, Mr. McClover. Right now, we have a concern voiced. This visit was short notice, Margaret. What's the matter? I'm going to be blunt, Mr. President. I've looked over your social security bill and it isn't what we agreed on. In fact, the more I read, the more concerned I became. It's too much, George. With the rates you're planning, people can get on by on unemployment indefinitely. There'll be no incentive to work. And then we will have to pay for it all. There's no room nor largesse on the scale, not within our current budgets. That means tax hikes, big ones. The voters won't stand for that. Heck, even your own wing of the party won't stand for it. I don't know if I even I can in good faith. Vote for the bill as it stands. Oh, boy. And, uh, cool. Let's keep going down. Booties for allies. It is June. 21 days. It'll be the July by the time this happens. Uh, August. And then basically September, the Senate votes. And who do you work for? Help win back the blue-collar voter base. Let's do booties for allies. Across the aisle, they're closest counterparts to the Democratic wing of the RDs. They're a mile more conservative than the liberal Republicans, but will generally understand this value of social welfare. We might be able to reach out to Goldwater and get him on board with the new legislation, although the buckley at Yankee will be a tough fella to convince. <clears throat> Alternatively, we could reach out to Bob Kennedy and his more progressive Democrats. He despises us for our stance on the civil rights issue, but he's always been a friend of the working man. We're not surprised he isn't defected to the center block by now. Oh boy. So actually, we can see with the cutting a deal here. Uh, that let's see. Actually, let's let's see. If this actually changed anything. Seventeen. Out, all the Dixie crap far right center supporter efforts. Th Fifteen out of thirty-seven uh, northern far right senators support us. So that's thirty-two plus twenty. That's fifty-two. So Republicans love it, and a few Democrats love this as well. And we saw the Iranian thing, which is still bugged, which we can send volunteers, but we don't need to see that. Cool. Hope you guys are having a good day. We've got a couple comments to go through as I speak very quickly. Uh, someone recommends I try out Soslav Comey. I hope to eventually. So, Comey's got so many different leaders that I'd love to play as all of them. Oh, well, probably will. Demand center loyalty. Five more centers on his side. Okay, just that's easy. Just you can just easily bribe five senators senators to do your bidding, which sounds probably like real life. But anyways, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Additionally, uh, someone actually wanted me instead instead of going down with uh, social security, they wanted me to go down with. Healthcare, so I, I got to that comment too late. So we we're obviously going down on social security for now just because it didn't really matter to me which way we went. So my apologies, but that's kind of the problem when I make a lot of videos in a single day. Uh, I can't, by the time I make videos or if I get comments late in the day, I can't address them. But get it ready for Congress. Now that we've decided what we want the social security to accomplish, it's time to prepare for the Senate floor. We'll formalize the particulars, handshakes, and get a final draft out of the committee and into the Congress. Depending on the actions taken previously, we may have secured or ruined our chances of getting it into Wallace's, onto Wallace's, Wallace's desk. There's still time to prepare in case we have other changes to make. Cool. Campaign. Kiss and booty, congressional style, and have a quick sip of some lukewarm coffee. Well, Social Security has general widespread appeal from both branches of the NPP. A few wearing nose will almost certainly kill any chance we have to, to help the good people of our country as such. And the next best strategy is to appeal to our rivals across the aisle. Perhaps some negotiations with major figures in the RDs will push our bill to victory. Wall Street's advisors have thus called a meeting and discussed the intricacies of gathering RD support. <clears throat> All men in the room agree that a very large majority of Republicans will vote to sink the bill, given the specifics of it, so any negotiations with them are hopeless. As such, any hope of bipartisan support lies with the Democrats. However, the room is largely divided on which branch of the Democrats are to, assent, to attempt appeasing. Half the room would like to approach the fairly conservative uh, Senator Barrett Goldwater. The far-right MPP shares some aspects of social policies with Goldwater, and this can be used as leverage to garner support from the rather large shares of mainstream Democrats. Assuming that Goldwater supports a proposal, however, he is very staunchly right-wing economically and may shoot down any ideas of social security in its entirety. The other half of the room suggests reaching out to the RFK, the brother of the late President Kennedy. While RFK's progressive Democrats are a smaller caucus than Goldwater's, RFK will surely listen closely to our proposal, given his social democratic leanings and is more likely to bring his caucus behind him. However, this also means that he will oppose any over over segregation clauses in her bill. The final decision after this dis discussion rests with the president. I mean, honestly, it doesn't matter to me. If anything, as long as we don't lose senators, we'll be okay. We can beg Republic can we just beg Republicans? I'm not gonna I don't want to beg people. We just oh, just spend some political power and you can bribe even five more senators. And then five more senators. I'll go with Goldwater. Heck, or high Goldwater. Just just bribe them. That's all you have to do. Just pay them enough, and they'll do whatever you want. Heck, or high Goldwater. Today, President Wallace is set to meet with Senator Goldwater to discuss gathering Democratic support for the Wallace's Social Security bill proposal. Goldwater is likely a man with presidential ambitions, and as such, is likely to play hardball. With this mind, Wallace then hails calmly and enters the room in which Goldwater is waiting for him in the White House. Good to see you, Goldwater. The two shake hands, smiling warmly. Wallace sits down across Goldwater, and the two begin to chat intimately, discussing the bill's specifics. 
While the beginning of the proposal went rather well, Goldwater's enthusiasm dampened as Wallace kept talking, mainly Goldwater became more and more opposed about every the found, very foundations of the bill. Rather than specific clauses they were discussing, President Wallace, you're telling me that you want to reward the unemployed in this country? Why should we support the deceitfully lazily? And what about the unnecessary disability insurance and accessibility clauses? Do you know how much money we would squander in a very small minority in this country? Wallace was becoming increasingly less confident that Goldwater would support the very core of the bill as it was. Now, 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 I assure you that the programs like this will stop the poor and needy in America from turning to socialism. But, Mr. President, this bill is socialism. We need to cut down on unnecessary spending and work on repairing our national debt. Barry, do you not believe in the amount of productivity this will give the average American? Let it do more for our economy than a surplus will. So Goldwater immediately stood up. I'm not going to support a communist bill written by a communist leader himself. Good luck, President Wallace. And with Goldwater walking out of the room, any hopes of bipartisan support were swiftly dashed? Darn it, it's the best defense we have against communism. What is it, Huey Long? Okay, let's just bribe the senators. Okay, 17, 17, 20 out of 37, 5 out of 6, 12, all Republicans, just bribe them, don't talk with them, just give them money. <laughs> just give them political power, that's all you have to do. We literally have, let's see, 40, a 50, 67, we have, a, we have two-thirds majority. Saw it in PP campaign, great. All you have to do is just bribe your politicians, they'll do whatever you want. Works for them. Hmm. Oh boy, the 1972 Republican-Democrat primaries. <clears throat> the primaries and caucuses are over, and now a thousand delegates from every state and territory of the Union are converging on Miami Beach Convention Center in the eponymous city in Florida. This year, the fires boiled down to a two-horse race between former Secretary of Defense and Ford Motor Company Executive Robert McNamara and South Dakota Senator George McGovern. McNamara. His only government post was the Secretary of Defense, but seeks to bring business efficiency to governing, represents the more mainstream opinion of the ID parties of moderate Democrat. Well, McGovern is essentially liberal Republican with its unofficial slogan of acid and then it's Amnesty and abortion has become divisive across the nation and is posing a major question for the delegates of the convention. McGovern claims that he can take some of the votes of the NPP center wing, forging a new coalition that can expand America's progressive future, while McNamara's supporters are claiming that McGovern would destroy the RD party and hand another victory to the NPP. However, questions between both options abound. Is McGovern too far left wing to hold RDs together? Is McNamara's business experience a boon or a hindrance? Many Republican Democrats are expressing dismay that these are the only viable options they have this time. They have this time, and raising concerns of a lack of support and fracturing of party unity. But the results of the final ballot are being announced, and the winner is... Alright, Robert McNamara, the President for Prosperity. George McGovern, the soon-to-be head of the McGovern Mint. It sounds like we want the MPP to win. Um, we need McGovern because he sounds like he's very decisive. I think someone does want me to go with McNamara, but I've actually already played all the 1972 candidates before on this channel. Like, each, all six of them, including Gus Hall and Yaki, so... Uh, I'll, I'll probably just go with McGovern because it sounds like it would make it easier for us to win if we're going for the NPP, which I think we are. I can't remember, so we'll see. And can we suppress people's votes? Oh, we're just diminish the image. We're not suppressing people, we're just diminishing the image of certain parties here in America. Uh, I love it. Better APCs. Anything else here? Uh, we can see this twice. Okay. Social Security expansion. We love it. Well, maybe. We'll see. Cool. Get ready for Congress. Senate votes. Requires... Oh. Polls are updated. Cool. And uh, we need... Finalize the act. Um, oh. Towards Medicare. Social Security will help get the elderly out of the workforce and stimulate economic mobility, but it's not enough on its own. Many employers provide health insurance, and a lot of seniors are afraid to lose their health care if they retire. Thus, the MPP is proposing we adopt a national Medicare plan that will provide retirees with health insurance. This new legislation will not only prove popular with retired voters, the largest block voter group by far, but also with the center block of the party. If we can modify, mollify them with health care, Medicare, they might look the other way on Wallace's state rights legislation. The 1972 National Progressive Primaries. National Progressive Party is holding their convention in Miami Beach, Florida, in the midst of one of the greatest cultural changes in American history that is reverberating throughout the party that has long prided itself as representing the interests of those left behind by the RDs. But the issues are not moving away from the debates about civil rights for African Americans, the extent of social wealth, or how best to defeat Japan and to reclaim the lost Pacific territories, which we've already done. Now, issues over homosexuality, abortion, drugs, and others are claiming the attention of all sides of the MPP, but the party is facing another problem. The first MPP president ever elected, George Wallace, has declined to break the unofficial two term limit and will not be seeking a third term. Oh boy. The fractious party, having tenuously united under one leader for eight years, is now facing a leadership race that could destroy the fragile MPP coalition. In the end, none of the candidates receive enough delegates to win the primaries, leading to a brokered convention. Oh boy. The two leaders were Senator Henry, Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, Washington State, leading the CNPP and advocating for social welfare programs, and Jean, Jean Kirkpatrick, Congresswoman from Oklahoma and one of the strongest proponents and defenders of neoconservative movements that is coalescing in the far right NPP. 
However, it all comes down to the ballots of the delegates in Miami Beach Convention Center. And after a long day, not a voting. The chairperson is taking the stage to announce the results of the last ballot. And who Jackson will scoop the White House versus Jean Kirkpatrick. She can win no trick. Well, frankly, with this, the center here, I mean, the center MPP is not that strong. They only had six senators. That's really not that strong at all. Um, so, but then Jean Kirkpatrick, she's a neoconservative and... Some people have really strong opinions about neoconservatives, but it makes more sense we go with that way just because she's part of the you know, authoritarian democracy group. So I'll probably go with Gene Kirkpatrick with that one. East Coast might not be bad. Deep South, either East Coast or Deep South, or Great Plains. Deep South, uh, leading RD, leading. Who do the Rockies? It doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll do the Rockies, why not? Because we can. <clears throat> cool. And now this, for healthcare reform, far right doesn't really care for it that much, I guess. Restrict coverage. Ooh. Finalize the act. Well, let's see. So we have how many days for this? Thir two weeks. We'll be in August. We could probably do one more. Maybe maybe two more and then do fine. Oh, no, we can only do one more, maybe. Finalize the act. Um, Senate votes. Bills. Who do you work for? Oh, boy. So we'll see what happens. With that, it's by the voters. Maybe, oh, maybe I should have waited to like pressure people to vote for us, because only five. To, it's only sixteen for healthcare reform, so it is what it is. But still, all right. What do we got over here? Oh, Jack Helicopter Company's one. Maybe get some bigger ship stuff. Why not? But yeah, one of the comments said I should continue playing until like the. Until the end of the, like the focus tree for even the next president as well. But that was my plan all along. I usually like to finish my focuses or my campaigns with all possible avenues. So we'll see what happens. All right, so it's August. So we might be able to restrict healthcare more, more, more. Massively help its popular appeal. Massively increase the cost of maintaining medical benefits. Southern meet Southern. Encourage the elephant. So we basically need 42 days. We need five weeks to do so. We want to do that before the elections. We could probably do one more, and then we'll have to do the Senate votes. Restrict coverage. This might help the far right get uh, some more support for the bill if we do that. Oh, look at that. No, look at that. That's 20. That's 39. The far right dictocrats. If we get a few more far right senators, but then the center might not like us anymore. Democrats don't like it. Ooh, let's go with the one that helps us more, 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 more. You want health care? You got health care. Lower cost insurance for the elderly. Uninterrupted, un uninterrupted nursing home care for the chronically ill. Annual cost of living increases for benefits. No earning limitations for seniors. Disability benefits too. If you need health insurance, then Dr. Wallace is in. Oh boy. We will greatly expand the benefits package offered by Medicare. Our budget will take a hit and the northern far right block will cry foul. But by God, the voters will love it. This bill will build the momentum we need going to the next elections. So then we have to vote on it immediately after this probably. Hopefully we don't lose too many far right senators. Hopefully they'll still kind of go along with us but we can close that one out unhappy unhappy and yeah i don't know if how many senators we'll be able to keep here but whatever uh the mission images of republicans that's good nothing there so then more 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 the next technology will be done in a while and then we got to finalize the act probably immediately we won't have enough time i think oh crap calamitous mpp campaign yeah that's not looking good for us is it <laughs> uh after that yeah then the senate votes yeah after passing the House, the vote for both the proposed bills shall begin in the Senate. And that's right, already. Let's do that. That'll be good. Operation success is good. More, more, more. Uh, I don't want to support those guys over there. Let's drink the pro-American sentiment, shall we? So it's almost... Yeah, I, we got to go down to this one. Finalize the act. Because <clears throat> three weeks will be about in like little... Slightly after middle... September for this one and then October we don't have enough time for this other stuff so finalize the act we're now in the process of completing the final draft for Medicare bill this bill passed will hopefully ensure health care coverage for millions of less fortunate Americans this bill is controversial among the northern ranks of the far right bloc but has brought support across the south and center we can still make a few changes if necessary before sending it to the senate oh there goes Morocco good good job Morocco uh, Great Plains doesn't look too bad Great Plains, or... Yeah, I'll do Great Plains, but why not? There you go. Cool. Alright, so now we have... 20... Yeah, 39 so. 39. Too bad I can't bribe anybody else to do stuff. Polls are updated. Oh, boy. 
Throw me down the line. What are you thinking, George? What can you possibly be thinking? You want to have working Americans pay for the medical help the black layabouts now? Really, George? Oh, boy. You know, I know. All, and all the South knows that it's not the job of the government to impoverish hard-working Americans to fund socialist nonsense like public health care. These are the people who elected you, George, and this is how you pay them back. Where's your sense of decency? Next election comes closer every day, and you're serving up the South on a silver platter for the Democrats. Do you want to lose Goldwater? You you will if you don't change your tax. Click. We'll win them back over. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. They, we lost support. Well, we lost complete all support. God dang it. Well, we won't be able to pass this. 30 senators, senators say no. Everyone else loves Social Security, though. It's going to be a mixed bag. You can't win everything. It's all right. But whenever it plays Walsh again someday, I will make sure that we get healthcare reform passed and such like that. I'll spend more time on this than actually trying to do segregation stuff. So They're extremely unhappy, huh? Lack of segregation. Hmm. Well, when we get closer to the vote, can I bribe anybody else? I'd love to be able to bribe more people. Can I bribe more people? please because I'll do a hold a massive southern rally or something like that or meet with Harrington or something like that say it finalize the act it's not gonna go well for us Senate votes at long last it's time for Medicare and Social Security to have their day on the Senate floor let the discourse debate and hopefully not filibusters begin these new laws are critical to the unity of the NPP they are human humanitarian ventures that will cement our status as a party of the little guy they're the foundation upon which we will build our self-help initiatives they're the populist credentials Walsh and his party will need in the next election hopefully they'll see these on his desk after the Senate vote oh boy yeah, that's definitely not going to go there. 17-17, yeah. I mean, at least we'll get one thing done. Elite forces are done. Cool. Because the time for, uh, I don't know, segregation is pretty much passed at this point. Let's see, meet with Harrington. I mean, we're already pretty united. Can we suppress any more images? Eh, yeah, we'll wait. No, we're pretty much united. Yeah, completely pretty much united. So that's not bad. Labor achievements grow further divided, more satisfied. Expect more. Get more satisfied with the state's... Uh, let's try that once. So they're happy. Okay, we're happy with the state's rights. We kind of like that. Good. But how does that hurt our... I should probably stop scrolling up so much. Uh, they're willing to work together. Alright. How about we grow more united then? Because we have all the people we can we have, so... Further divided. Uh, we do that one. They're still happy. Alright. Well, we'll see what happens. A successful rally. I'm a government first, Kirkpatrick. So, rhetoric is going to be a funny thing. <clears throat> and before we do that, they're still working together, which is okay. When Bob decided to attend Wallace's rally, he was at the brink of banning him for good. Back during the campaign trail, he made great promises and implied every, ever greater things. And what little of this event that eventually materialized, not much, if anything. It was supposed to be Wallace's last chance to find an opportunity to reveal something big in terms of white values. It takes something big, like a full repeal of the Civil Rights Act or segregated welfare to keep his support. That's what he thought when he drove to the rally anyway. Seeing Wallace on stage, however, completely blindsided him. Sure, he did nothing but reiterate the same three talk points while promising any concrete actions, but when did... When a speech has ever been about the content, Walsh was charismatic, rousing, electrifying. He was a man who was mastering the art of talking, like, and like unlike any other. The crowd was like putty in his hands, cheering after every dramatic pause by Walsh, and Bob cheered with him. Being part of that gigantic crowd was an experience unlike any other, and almost a religious event with a savior being in the center of it. It took 90 minutes, and these 90 minutes were enough to stick with Bob for a lifetime. On his drive home, all of Bob's worries and fears were blown away like dust in the wind. Walsh was still worth supporting after all, and this yaki guy might be a little bit too radical after all. Surely his president was set to enact the segregationist legislation he had so desperately craved, but he just had to wait a little, that's all. What does Walsh ever lie to his voters? Patience will be rewarded, right, in the 72 election debates, McGovern versus Kirkpatrick. While the urban machine exchanged deals for votes and committees arranged donation drives and canvases as they always had, America's voting, public's, uh, pu voting public speculated the quadrennial tradition's most recent addition to the comforts of homes the nation over. At the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, RD candidate George McGovern engaged his national progressive counterpart Gene Kirkpatrick on the, in the first of a series of televised presidential debates covering topics both foreign and domestic. Below's excerpt from the heated exchange that night. McGovern, you're playing dangerous games, Kirkpatrick. No wars, wars, no remedy to the sins that all countries in ours, but neither is exchanging our principles for base power. I and a million other servicemen didn't risk our lives fighting fascism only to watch our government court fascist brutes like they've been with us since Akagi. Best keep that in mind if you want to choose, if you choose to follow through with this madness, Kirkpatrick. Color me surprised. I half imagine you liberals would know redemption better than me and my conservative associates. Apparently not, no, but no matter. Feel free to keep fitting your round pegs into square holes till Election Day, Senator. Rest assured that the National Progressive Party will graciously receive your gratitude for winning the Cold War ten years from now. Voters out with Kirkpatrick? Cool. Right now, all I wanted to do was placate people who are unhappy with our administration, because soon it's not going to matter at all. More unified. 
The Godfather releases, releases. If you like to rebel this, please go right ahead. This happens every time he plays America. Ave Maria, gratia plena. It's a lot of MPP campaign. Good job, guys. Good job. God dang it. If we didn't lose the... Oh, that sucks. Whatever. That really sucks. Oh, maybe we actually had time to do one more. We might... We Yeah, we had time to do one more. It was getting pretty close, though, so... It's all right. Who do you work for? Yourself. America's not always black and white. President Wallace had known a simple truth upon his entrance into the presidency. The nation stands divided. It would not be the stability and small steps of the RDs that would finally end the crisis plaguing the society of the U.S., but rather the strength of a true patriot. The strength Wallace felt he harbored within himself. And now, with black and whites fighting across the nation, it's time to take a stand. Those darn uh, African Americans will always always did cause issues for us, Wallace seemingly muttered to himself. Nevertheless, he knew it was going to be soon that he would have to make his move. In that regard, Wallace had only one question, what was that move? Wallace looked over the reports issued in a variety of inspections conducted by the federal government and in all. He noticed a training pattern, wherever it was by law or per by, by practice. Black Americans were immediately dealing with a lot of obstacles put forward by the local, state, and sometimes federal government. He noticed reports of stores closed off to blacks, schools segregated, all the way to social events in southern states designed as white only. Wallace knew that he had championed the notion of segregation and the freedoms of Americans to practice their lives as they wanted, but a creeping thought irked him all the while. What is there further segregation wasn't needed. It was a question that ate away at the president, but no matter what, he knew that with the growing troublesome troubles of his age, he was going to have to move in some direction and do it soon. President Wallace wanted to guarantee the traditions of the patriotic citizens of the U.S. However, the question of it meant the separation or seg separation of school children had to be done to achieve this repeatedly flared up in the Alabama's mind. Decisions shall be made. America shall grow stronger. Yaki MPP popularity in the South will grow. Cool. Who do you, who do you work for? Yourself. Now that Social Security and Medicare are out of the way, Wallace can turn his attention back to defending freedom on the whole front, specifically. It was planned to overhaul the American welfare state and replace it with American welfare states. See, federal aid is federal tyranny. It comes with too many strings attached and become just another way for Washington to force the South to toe the liberal line. Well, President Wallace is going to change that forever. We'll also begin considering a revision of the federal welfare laws to give states more control over how welfare funds are allocated. We can either retain some federal funding for states' welfare while giving states more say over how it's spent, or we could cut the strings completely and let the states fund their own welfare programs. The latter would be the purest economic expression of the defederalized vision, but many proved to be a bridge too far for rural white voters. Nice. So Medic the Medicare bill fails. Now we're going to do this one first because we'll be seen as incompetent, but I want to get more support from this one. So, in a major setback for George Wallace's administration, the Senate has rejected his plan for Medicare, a plan to provide subsidized health care to Americans 65 and older, as well as those suffering from de debilitating diseases that would over otherwise send them into poverty. The failure of this bill is a grave blow to the American people, the White House press secretary said in a statement to the press earlier today. The Senate today has con condemned millions of our elderly past their working years and in retirement to a poor and destitute future without getting the health care they need. Those opposed to the bill decry the social takeover of the health care system, while many uh, doctors and private insurance companies say that Medicare would be just the first step in a Marxist plot to destroy American culture and democracy, while others denounce the act for not covering every citizen in a subsidized health care plan. That like which many countries around the world have established in the past two decades, and for the foreseeable future, the status quo will remain. What happened to helping out the old and the sick? Apparently they don't care. They don't care. Alright, up here, up next, um, what do we want? The Great Plan's looking real good now. Deep South? Yeah, we're gonna lose the Deep South. We'll do the Deep South next. They're still happy for us. The Social Security bill, though, passes. Today, the Senate has approved President Wallace's proposed Social Security program, which will provide old age survivor and disability payments to every American citizen paid through payroll taxes. The Senate has made the right choice, President Wallace said in the White House press room just a couple of hours after the votes were cast. And after a sound this bill tomorrow, all working Americans will be able to rest easy knowing that they'll have a guaranteed income after their retire or injury on the job. The bill passed the Senate despite a serious opposition from many corners. Laws of fair capitalists and fiscal conservatives have decried government intervention in the massively increased federal budget, Social, social Security. Security would entail, while others on the left are angry that the program doesn't really go far enough. However, Social Security is now a reality, and soon government offices will begin issuing ID cards and ma mailing checks to those that need it. Supporting the American worker even after retirement on the younger people's dime. Cool. So we got slightly better, slightly, slightly better poverty monthly change. Let's increase segregation status. Cool. Because we segregate Social Security, become more popular in southern states. The effects of the address bill make us less popular in non-southern states. Because we took the focus, spend, 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 it'll cost more to maintain. The poverty rate will go down quicker, which is good. We will be more popular nationwide because we pass the bill. Uh, we'll become more popular nationwide. Our expenses will rise. Poverty will go down quicker. Okay, well, let's see what happens. How much is it going to cost us? Holy bad words. Jesus, bad words. But hey, look at that. 5.75. You know what? Everything has a cost. And who do you work for? This help us win back blue-collar voting jobs. I don't know if we can... Yeah, okay, at this point, that's... That, wow, that costs a lot. Holy crap. Social Security. Well, at least we won one, and with the money that the retirees get from Social Security, maybe they can afford their, their medical bills now. <laughs> hey, it all works out in the end, maybe. 
Oh, uh, what is it? Education, social laws, economic laws. We have pensions, acceptable pensions. Cool. China modernizes. Cool. We had was it? No pensions, frequent pensions. So way higher cost, but hopefully social security can make up for it in the future. That is my hope. Oh, now they're unhappy. God dang it. Can we diminish the image of Republicans and Democrats again? God dang it, we can't. Um, oh, the MPP's united, though. We'll see what happens. I'll be honest. Like, playing in America is you know, so much fun. I love screwing up the country. Or making it better, according, uh, depending on your opinion. So, Yep, not too bad. Oh, come on, guys. All right, glass. Oh, God, let's see what happens. Oh, I'm not ready to look at this. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to look at this. Oh, we lost so much far-right support. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, man. More than a year of announcements, debates, speeches, and rallies have come to an end on November 7th, 1972, with Election Day. Millions of Americans have lined up at school gymnasiums, libraries, civil centers, and fire stations across the nation to fulfill their civic and democratic duty. This year marks the 47th quadrennial presidential election, but there will also be 20 state and territory gubernatorial elections to decide governors, 33 state seat, Senate seats, and all three, 435 seats in the House of Representatives and many other local and state elections for mayor, counselors, sheriffs, and judges all across the nation. However, the presidential election is just what everyone's tuning into their TV and radio to learn about the polls are closed. As the polls are closed. As the night goes on and the votes are counted and reported, it soon becomes clear. <coughs> we'll be sitting in the White House for the next four years. President-elect Kirkpatrick, god dang it. Uh, that's not a solid South. It's a solid Midwest, if you really want to know. The solid Midwest. Solid South is broken. George Wallace pretty much abandoned his voter base, which you never want to do, but hey, whatever. States own spending. Well, since we're down here... President, more power but lower autonomy of states. The conservatives is like this. More states' rights, promote cooperation. Um, expenses rise sharply. Tr the Dixie tradition. States own spending. Well, yeah, we're going to go with this one just because, I mean, it just makes more sense. We want to go more states' rights, right? Any self respecting American conservative knows that the local state governments always know best what the real needs of the people are. The government must, use, must be free to set their own policy and use the budgets in whatever they deem most appropriate. States, uh, increase states' autonomy. Well, we're kind of screwed. So, we lost eight, 19 far-right senators, five from the center. The RDs are back in power. God dang it. Can we just bribe them people again? Man, well, it is what it is. We, we're still technically leading the far-right, so we only need a few RDs to pass things. So, um, yeah. Wait, the House? Okay, so, he, wow, this is a fairly, not extremely close, but it's fairly divided at election. The RDs got 217 House votes, while the NPP got 300-some thousand 300,000, 321 votes, so, hey, America's a little divided, so, okay, so here we are, State Financial Independence Act, so, the far right loves it, and the Democrats, we love the Democrats, and our party center opposes, senator, the one senator, the, the center MPP has just utterly been destroyed, you know what, screw it, we can spend some political power to do, talk with the Republicans, why not, 35, that's 69, right, 69, nice, 72 senators. How many can we get? The section results. If you like to read about this, go right ahead. And then the polls are updated. Cool. The season's over. Hello to the chief. Cool. Thank goodness. It's over. But the fight has just started. Oh my goodness. Talk with the Republicans. All right. Let's see what the Republicans have to say. SFIS brings up success in Congress. Washington, D.C., the capital of America. And as referred to in some circles, the capital of the free world, and freedom obviously comes in the form of a representative democracy here in the U.S. However, President Wallace and his administration have taken to a more economic interpretation of the nickname, as constant work has been put forward to free the American market from federal intervention as much as possible. However, today stands as a landmark for the president's, president's successes, as the State Financial Independence Act, also called SFIA, which intends to cur cut incredible amounts of federal infrastructural interventions coming to pass in Congress. On one side... The administration has collectively cried to joy as constant fighting back and forth between the legislative and executive branches finally made some leeway in the success of the act. President Wallace himself commented, saying that Americans across the country will enjoy unprecedented economic freedom without the worry of regulations, rules, and governance from D.C. any longer. Meanwhile, several Democrat and far-right MPP governors have offered the conjoined support for the President and the State and Financial Independence Act, with many claiming that the Capitol held a stranglehold over the potential working towards American infrastructure for years. Nevertheless, large swaths of the population found outrage with the passing of the bill, and many have protested the leg legislative branch itself. Claiming that it's become bullied by President George C. Walls. Ardent progressives of both parties and blue collar workers came together to oppose the passing of the bill, with one Republican rep representative offering a statement saying that President Walls and his entire administration seek for nothing but more than an abandonment of the American people because he intimidates, he's a bully. Besides party divides, many economic analysis have stated that the drastic turn in the American economy will take time to tell its benefits and misgivings. Change no more, break your chains, no more handouts. 
We must get rid of the idea that the federal government can replace the states and their duties. You're all responsible for your own problems. Work on your own solutions of fixing them instead of begging Washington for help. Social swing will grow. Let's political power. Defederalization will continue. The South will flock to Yaki. Cool. Diminish it. Oh. Oh, boy. Well, it's too late for Gus Hall, but it's all right. Well, this, we won't be able to get rid of the debt, which is really disappointing. But, hey, we did the best we can. But what's more, you know, what's more, uh, what was it? Um, whatever. Cool. Let's grab some Scott Helles. Cool. Is there a fleet snacks, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, a lot of the centers, they love spending money like crazy. Let's go with fleet command and control. Happy 1973, everyone. Hope you're having a great, great year. Ah, oh, I can't wait. So, actually, two weeks left, and there'll be basically time for, uh... Oh, second thoughts about states' rights now. Then we'll have a basically new president, and we'll see what happens. So, we'll finish no more handouts, and we probably won't do this, because we don't want the, the voter base to have second thoughts about what we're doing, so... Hard work and honesty, any American can find prosperity, because we're unified, which is all right. They're happy with states' rights, cool. And political landscape, we're ready for anything, so... Doesn't even matter to me now. Cool. No more handouts, everyone. No more handouts. Sorry. No more handouts, though. And we should have a new president. Oh, we actually had a little bit of debt. Or look at reserves. Cut that stuff down. This land is her land. She didn't know how much, uh, how many had come to the National Mall today, staring back at her in a sea of blank, unknown places. Less than a minute ago, it was pomp and circumstance. A long ceremony, a marching band, a Bible, and a cacophony of cheers. And that minute, something had changed. The woman at the podium was now the most powerful on earth, with all the hope for dread that accompanied such a fact. Now, perhaps a million voices lay quiet, and with their expected owners wrapped in scarves and coats, anxiously awaiting the words of the new president, Jean Duane Kirkpatrick. Among, among the foremost duties of a government in the provision for the common defense, a guarantee against external aggression, the survival of our way of life. We must ask ourselves, as a government fulfilling such duties, as evidenced by foreign troops on rival American soil, and the continued warnings from military men that our current strategy is ineffective, and my very presence on these steps, perhaps the answer is no. I've been elected and approved by the American people to head a new presidential administration. I know full well that the responsibilities placed to me by them and by God, and will fulfill them to the best of my ability. The troubles faced today by our nation cannot be solved by a single man or woman. It does not require the sacrifice that so many have made in service to democracy, as in the Argonne, the Bougain Bill, or in the dunes of the Nimib. However, it does require the best effort of every citizen to believe in themselves and their capacity for great deeds. In this endeavor, I have the utmost confidence in the people of the U.S. to adapt and to overcome their challenges. For we are the pro progeny of almost two centuries of great individuals. We are America, and with our exceptional will and grace by God, we shall, no child should prove too great for our strength to overcome. Godspeed, Madam President, the first female president of the United States, the Kirkpatrick Presidency. Kirkpatrick presidency. The election of the academic and former diplomat Jean Kirkpatrick has surprised even the most shrewd political analysis. A woman with limited political experience and a controversial background was not the top choice for one of the two major political parties. Swept into office on an MPP surge after the aftermath of the oil crisis, she now faces the task of restoring confidence in the executive office and the reputation of the U.S. abroad. This task will be a daunting one, though over the initial shock of the oil crisis, America still had a vulnerable economic state and beset by a domestic unrest. President Kirkpatrick is prepared to respond to both problems swiftly, to curb the influence of radicals and restore certainty in the future of our nation. Gets the event too soft. Nice. Nah, call up Langley. We've got work to do. Oh, boy. Oh, what can we do with South America now? I can't wait. Not too much, I guess. Huh. Help out Central America? Nice. And after that one, We'll probably go meeting with a director. The CIA has maintained a mandate to operate without serious oversight by the president for almost three decades. They have been left to effectively run themselves, promoting a culture of stagnancy and inefficiency. Wasting money on speculative science on dubious value and initiatives that lack a clear direction, this ends now, though. The, pres the Intellectual Intelligence Committee is a rather critical part of the president's new foreign policy initiative, for it is the most capable tool by which we can take advantage of the weaknesses of ideologically opposed governments. We've already tapped a new candidate for director. Once they're approved by Congress, a meeting must be upheld immediately. Langley and the West Wing must cooperate or operate in close coordination to properly accomplish their goals and rumblings of change. The clan rallies, as they often do, through the streets of southern towns. The locals are amendable to them, furious as they are being forced to live alongside blacks, and so they march confidently and proudly as they go. Suddenly, they find themselves faced with another crowd, a wash of all races gathered to stand against clans marchers. Many come in, come in from out of town in an unprecedented level of organized resistance. Soon, violence breaks out between the two sides and the clan are forced to retreat. A gaggle of union representatives sit across from the factory boss. Once, police would have quickly dispersed the striking workers outside like they did at Blair Mountain. Now, with union membership soaring, the boss sits and quietly sees as he reads their list of demands. He's darned if he lets them strike 
a strike goes on any longer, but fulfilling their demands would ruin him in the long run. The union reps sit and smile, knowing that he has no choice, confident that they will finally have the strength to effect real change. There is power in the union once more. The once lone voice of the left NPP meets with the most radical dissent in Washington. The left argues that they have done all they can by playing nice and adhering to the system. For the first time, the once moderates are amenable to their argument. A decision is made, more funding is allocated to the left, and those within the center who are tired of getting nowhere help to greet these radicals with whatever they need. A time of mere questioning is over, more and more people are beginning to take direct action against what they perceive as injustice and indignity in the country. And they're beginning to push towards the halls of power, unless the establishment can offer up a meaningful solution to the problems faced by the American people. They will continue to turn towards those with fire in their hearts, sounds no more too soft. President Jean Kirkpatrick felt the smooth surface of the resolute desk fell at the hundredth time. She was here and it was hers, and that seemed an impossible, extraordinary feat. A manila forward lay on the desk. She wrapped her fingers on the smooth, tarnished wood, patiently waiting to discussion the folder's contents. A short cat rap came at the door, and her new Secretary of State, Walt Rostow, marched in without invitation. Madam President, I understand that you want to speak with me regarding assignments and removals in the State Department. She handed Rostow the feather, and she flipped through it, and he flipped through it slowly. Madam President, there is some of the most capable diplomats the State Department has. You want me to sideline or fire them? Men like Jack Vaughn are too soft. I beg your pardon, surely you can't be serious. Mr. Rostow, I'm not in the habit of making jokes on the affairs of state. These individuals need to be replaced. I have a list of suitable candidates for each position. The details may be determined at your discretion. I'd rather not remove so many, especially not ones who are so capable, Mr. Secretary. And in the coming weeks, you will either remove these individuals or join their number. You may fall in line or step aside, but you will not stand in my way. Rostow grimaced slightly, but nodded, and left the Oval Office without a word. Jean Kirkpatrick returned to feel in the smooth varnish of the Resolute Desk, awaiting yet more meetings scheduled today, all according to plan. Yeah, you know what? Oh, we don't have that much here. Good. Oh, we're well, actually are pretty united. And the Senate, or the Senate of the MPP, is pretty much done. The Kirkpatrick Doctrine? Aw, oh, yeah. Our foreign policy has been fundamentally misguided since the great mistake of South Africa. For far too long, we've been guided by naive idealism and a masochistic devotion to supporting governments that proclaim freedom and anti fascism. This must be ended. The new sworn president is known for a new pragmatic and realistic approach to foreign policy. Instead of bending to the naive desire to promote liberty and democracy on a world scale, we must recognize that we must foster democracy through the establishment of strong and stable governments that can serve as a solid foundation for the future of a global alliance. These governments must not be weakened by our attempts to inorganically democratize them, but instead must be hardened against outside influence from the geopolitical rivals and internal revolutionary movements alike, and ye shall know the truth. The meetings with James Engleton, the new director of the CIA, had gone very, very well, of course. President Gene Kirkpatrick didn't think it could have possibly gone poorly, but it was better than expected together. They laid out the plans for the expansion of the agency's budget, as well as the realignment of the agency towards anti-fascism. Regime changes in several disagreeable governments throughout Latin America were beginning to take shape. Well, Madam President, said Engleton, most of the plans for Kirkpatrick Doctrine are being set in place. I take objection to that name. It's a product of many people's pragmatism and not exclusively my own. Regardless, I think it's best we move on to domestic matters. The agency has identified many potential threats to the U.S. government, such as the Black Panthers. That way, it may be prudent to keep tabs on. Kirkpatrick leaned towards boards on the resolute desk. And what do you recommend about we do with these threats? Angleton pulled out a manila folder out of his blazer and slid across to the president. She opened it, finding pages upon pages of names. Gus Hall, Angela Davis, Francis Yock, and dozens of others. Next to each of them was a word or a phrase in blocked red ink. Monitor, counteract, submit for arrest, or submit for termination. Kirkpatrick looked back to Angleton and astonished. What is this? Now, hold on. Angela Davis. She, is she the leader in the Red World uh, that leads California to the West Coast, like, communist faction? Chaos, but, hmm. Make the shipments? Nice. President Kirkpatrick is not a woman to be trifled with, nor will she allow on her guidance and command for the U.S. to be bullied across around the rest of the world. Out on the tropics of the Caribbean, pirates reign and scourge of seas of the colonists forging their way there. Now, however, the authoritarians of fascists are more than make up make. Uh, make up for the long dead scourges. As the heartless dictators opened the way for the Germans and the Japanese to sink their teeth in America's underbelly. And like the strong will of the British law centuries ago, we shall see them hang. Most notably, the hangman reaches for the regime of Joachim Balaguer, who has managed to imprison his republic in a gridlock of authoritarianism and oppression. While the opposition striving for democracy crawls in the shadows, however, we shall ship over our best arms and ammo to ensure a fiery end of the unjust reign of Balaguer over the Dominicans. Who, hopefully, verbal is not helping because we don't want him to see, we don't want to see him injured. The winds have changed. Secretary of Defense John McCain Jr., oh boy, looked puzzled by what his associates 
Walt, Rostow, and Gene Kirkpatrick were discussing their meeting in the Oval Office had begun in earnest, but so far all the talks they had was about the Dominican Republic, and how important it was to protect American interests overseas. So, he began, you plan on completely overthrowing the government of the Dominican Republic without having a single American soldier involved? Kirkpatrick nodded, and John McCain became even more puzzled. Then why am I here? Secretary McCain, the Western Hemisphere occasionally requires a deft touch, and occasionally a less than deft touch. The plans set forth by the CIA are not in conflict with those of the Department of Defense, rather they require them. These regime changes need to happen, and the agency will get them done, but the U.S. military to ensure that these new regimes remain loyal. Like Guyana? Like Guyana, said Rostow. Most of the regimes throughout Latin America are less than friendly to American interests and far too friendly to those of our enemies. The Dominican Republic is a domino that might fall over given just one small push. We need to make sure that it falls on our side. Once that's done, the muscle of the American military will be a good motivator for them to stay on our side. The pieces fall into place. Oh, John McCain, please do your best. Begin the destabilization. We love it. Revolutions can have an endless supply of guns, bullets, and bombs blast their way through the opposition government. However, if they don't have the popular support and the manpower to use all that equipment, then not a darn thing is going to end up happening. Thus, it is now our duty to begin reinforcing the foundation of revolution and revolt against the fascist sympathetic the fascist sympathetic governments across the ways. For now, hundreds of thousands have rallied in the name of standing against the dictatorship of Balaguer and his collaboration with fascist powers from the streets of Santiago de los Caberos to the cabinets of the, sa the capital of Santo Domingo de Guzman. People are tired of giving in to the wants and wants and desires of fascists and President Kirkpatrick is more than happy to oblige their defiance. Oh, operations. What was that? Uh, intensify volunteers now. We're good. Find a front man. Washington, Boulevard, Lenin, Castro, all these men stand greatly different from one another, and we may not like some of them, but they all have one thing, one commonality with one another. Being the shining star behind a long, well, hard-fought revolution that forged a new path in history and a new life for all their constituents. The brewing conflict in the Dominican Republic needs such a revolutionary actor, someone courageous, someone charismatic, someone willing to do all that it takes to earn their people's freedom, and America's its ally to the Southwest. To shield the continuous strikes of the fascist acts against the door of the New World. Sure, some may call the practice of searching for such a face to the revolution outdated, but accuse of it of limiting the breadth by which the revolution can expand for the country, but America's best interests lie on the safeguarding of the revolution, and a shining star can help kickstart their progress. The progress quickly, and as quickly and securely as possible. Nice. A Castillo of our own. CIA Director James Engleton stepped into the Secretary of State Walt Rostow's office with some purpose. He tossed a manila folder onto Rostow's desk, so he began. The president wants a Dominican president ousted by this man. Vincho Castillo, replied Rosso, puffing up a cigarette. A Dominican lawyer, political figure, and leader of the opposition. It's a good thing, too. Castillo, Joaquin Balguer, is a bit of a fascist strongman. And Castillo isn't. Rosso smiled. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't. But he's better than the alternative. In any case, how have your preparations for his who gone? Well, after making a few calls, a few bribes, and a few friends, I'd say our friends in Hispaniola. How's his chess board set? He's got a few thousand CIA arms, militiamen at his back. And the Dominican army? We're looking into that. Word in Langley is that the commander of the sent. So Domingo Garrison might take a, take a donation over a paycheck. Well then, what are you waiting for? All that remains is the order. Maybe we should rally the party. The far right of the NPP has taken a massive shift in initiative over the past decade, and if we fail to reinvigorate the party to stand with President Kirkpatrick and request to protect the American shield of democracy, then everything we have built up to this point shall crumble and fall as well. Segregation is old, reformists of new, and American conservatives of old of now must band together behind the star-spangled banner, for it is the far right of the NPP that upholds the light of patriotism against the darkness of fascists and imperialists abroad. Besides, organizing the party will allow us to rein in all the weak-willed, rubber-spawn bureaucrats of the party who keep getting shoved around like the likes of the RDs. But taking hold of our more liberal-minded brethren across the wings of the MPP as well. Grow them more unified, even though we're completely unified. Restore war powers? Ooh. Maybe we won't do that one last. Operation? Let's do this one. Open the floodgates. When it comes to dealing with subversive elements within the U.S., we do not have the luxury of a light touch. Change cannot be dictated by small groups of sign-waving radicals who only care about their own pet causes. Ideals that fail to thrive in the marketplace of democracy cannot be given special treatment. But these radicals fail to realize that the harm they do to the nation. Operation Chaos will enable us to monitor and suppress these dangerous organizations. The majority will be simply monitored. Those found to be dangerous will be suppressed by our own front organizations, and the most dangerous ones will be targeted for dismantlement. If sufficient legal evidence to arrest prominent dissidents cannot be found, it will be created. Democracy will, re will represent the will of the people, not radical fringe movements. Oh boy. Mm, yep, that's the image of the Democrats, even though it doesn't even matter anymore. The American way, my friends. After we choose some more technology, thank you for the signal company. Vice President Sam Yorty stepped up onto this office of a superior. Gene Kirkpatrick admiring the Oval Office. Ah, good to see you, Sam, said Kirkpatrick with a smile. I have something I want to discuss with you. Oh? As you know, I don't make my choices of allies lightly, and there was a reason I chose you as my running mate. Your team raised an eyebrow. Are you choosing to inform me of this now, after we've already won and been inaugurated? I was under the impression that one won an election before 
beginning the administrative duties of the office, and I hope you don't need a lesson. Regardless, you know, as you know, you're a very, shall we say, colorful individual in American politics. Some people hate you, but many love you. Your point being, my point being that no matter what you say, people are going to listen to it for the heck of it. You're entertaining, in short. So when I say that you're going to be the linchpin of garnering support for foreign intervention here in the homeland, I mean it. You already smiled knowing his job just became a whole lot more important. Thank you, Madam President. Nice. Oh, I love it. Except for the debt. We don't love that. And deficit. We really don't love that. Restore war power, shall we? Some people in this country who lack the guts to stand up for it have criticized the actions of presidents and past... Uh, of a brave utilizing our brave soldiers on air, land, and sea to protect our interests around the world. Those people who are the same ones who thank for allowing Adolf Hitler's boot, boot print to be stamped across all of Europe and allowed Hideki Tojo to cleave the American spirit in twain across the Pacific. Now we have to focus on a greater future, one that we won't give even give the enemy the chance to subvert our power across the world, a future illuminated by the beacon of democracy. However, to do this, we'll have to take some grand steps in, in terms of legislation and knock down a few pegs from the checks and balances that are preventing the Kirkpatrick administration from fully protecting the interests of America. In particular, the War Powers Resolution has been has put a stranglehold over against the President's ability to act quickly and effectively, requiring a full 48 hours to alert of alert to Congress in advance, with full ability to get shot down by those bureaucratic dudes, and a strict time limit on the length of our intervention. Thus, we need to tear this act out of the legal system so we may act as a sword and shield of the American spirit across the world. Dreams of white sand, though. <clears throat> CIA Director James Angleton stepped into the office of his deputy, Vernon Walters, placing a few thick folders on the man's desk. He was staring idly at a picture of a house next to an absurdly white beach that seemed to go on for eternity. Morning, Walters, said Angleton. Are you ready, already wanting to head back down to Florida? Morning, boss, Walters said. I'm just reminiscing. What's all this? Personnel reassignments to Operation Chaos. More than a thousand agents and employees are to be allocated. I expect them all to receive the new assignments by month's end. And we are, there are also details for the first moves, individuals of interest, and so on. Walter flipped through the files and froze his brow. I don't know you had gotten approval for the operation to be on such a large scale, you know, this is this is extreme. We're sending almost 5% of our personnel to illegally spying on the American public. Illegal, don't be so dramatic. We're just bending the rules a little bit. I've got a little, got a lot to do, so I'll leave it to you, leave it to you. But if you're so bothered by it, you can go back to Florida. There's already a home waiting for you. Angleton left the office before Walters could reply. He looked down at the papers and sighed, a pit forming in his stomach. He glanced back up the picture of the beach with a little summer house. The gentle swelling waves of the ocean rippling in the distance. Maybe I will, he said, with no one, said to no one in particular. Operation Chaos is proceeding. All right, so what can we do here? So all 35, obviously, of our people support are built. Six out of 30, that's 20 We have, with one. So that's literally 35 plus 20 is 56. Talk with the party social democrats. Well, there's literally only one, so... Finding the Friends of America. And here with us, in the studio tonight... Vice President Sam Yordi speaking to America on President Kirkpatrick's foreign policy. The studio audience clapped politely as Vice President Yordi smiled easily, nodding at the cameras. He's been practicing at lectures on the radios for days, now polishing everything for tonight for prime time. President Kirkpatrick and yourself won the election on a promise of standing up for America and a dangerous world. How is the administration putting that vision of foreign policy to work? I'll tell you one thing, we're not going to convince the Germans and Japanese to play nicely with us. The Germans salute Hitler's corpse and the Japanese think their emperor is a living god. We're not going to get anywhere by trying to reason with these people. The interviewer grimaced. Sir, America has fought two wars in the past decade and a lot of families wonder if their sons will be sent to yet another foreign war. <laughs> Yorkie chuckled. Uh, the President and I aren't warmongers. We're not out to conquer the world like Hitler and Hirohito, but you under underestimate how many people want a positive relationship with America, despite what their leaders say. They want American capital, American engineering, and American goods. Our foreign policy is based on finding and working with these friends of America. And we'll give them the tools to be heard. Which is very, very good. We'll give them the tools. So they can themselves free themselves with maybe a few American advisors, maybe a few hundreds of thousands of soldiers helping them out. So, uh, Democrats, yeah, that, that would be kind of a waste of time. Uh, let's do, um, increase stability? Sure, why not? Because right now, we've got, we're pretty, we're really divided. We'll finish out with make the call. The gunpowder has been laid, the machine guns have been entrenched, and the operas have trained their militia, and the people's voices are on the air. All that takes for a Balaguer's fascist-minded government to crash and burn now is a spark. And America, oh beautiful, for spacious skies, is a matchbox filled to the brim. It may stand true that the revolutionaries off the Dominican coast may walk from all different paths of the lives, businessmen, market salesmen, soldiers, politicians, and more. However, while some of them may have been the chance of bicker and squabble, none of that matters now that the revolution is prepared. The guns are loaded. The people are rallied. The leadership is, has a new face. It is our duty more now than ever to secure America's safety by bringing down the network of fascist influence in the Caribbean, and Balaguer's spiderweb will be the first to burn against the flame of the beacon of liberty. There's no hiding from the light of freedom in the third world as the sun rises on the new Americano century. But we got to finish this first with 
our act. Ooh, nice. Republicans? No, thank you. Disgusting. Oh, what happened to the bill? Where's the bill? Oh boy, did the bill die? Or did it live? As it so into new hats. We can't build crap here either. Jesus Christ, that's so bad. Um, we we'll probably just wait a little bit longer, but getting a lot more political power. Look at that poverty rate, 5.75. Did poverty rate get worse here? Hmm, maybe it did. 25% living poverty. Oh, expanded task force capabilities. Bastion on the seas. We'll do that one. I like the carrier stuff. Operation success. Hmm. Maybe it's bugged and where we don't get it. Oh. Okay, so yeah. So we had to do maybe had to do that one. Maybe. Well, let's wait and see what happens. Not bad. It's been a fun campaign, I'd say. Or we probably actually have to manually do the coup thing. So yeah. 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 Well, oh, that really hurts your political power game by quite a bit. Wow. Intensify the volunteers. Ooh, better weapons. Nice. Law. Dark Dave Langley. Oh boy. President Jinker Patrick, Secretary of State Ro 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 Rostow, Secretary of Defense John McCain Jr., and CIA Director James Angleton sat around and mapped the Dominican Republic with a stench of tobacco smoke filling the dank meeting room. Angleton pointed at various blue markers that dotted the map of the island nation. Several police departments in Santo Domingo and Santiago de los Caberos have quietly expressed support for the Castillo's movement. When his forces, now numbering around 8,000 men, move out of the jungles, they'll seize the largest cities without too much internal resistance. The general security guarding Santo Domingo said he won't have his men interfere either. How much did that cost us? asked the president. Not too much, said McCain. I'll figure out most of the Dominican military can see the writing on the wall. Away from the cameras of the press corps, Jean Kirkpatrick took a long drag on her cigarette. Why would she smoke cigarettes? Cigars, woman, cigars. American interests come first, she said. Coldly, we do things to protect those whom we love and that, that which we hold dear. America. She tapped out the ash and laid a smoke onto the tray. She looked at Angleton, make the call. Making the call. Beautiful. And so Dusk approaches New Order. Thank you for playing. It has been one heck of a campaign. Ah. Uh, Oh, Jacopo, Jacobo, who are you? You're not a Castillo. We did Santo Domingo, right? Yeah, Santiago de los Caba Caballeros. I've been saying that wrong. Caballeros, I think. Um, all right, cool. Not bad. I guess that's going to be the campaign. So, hey, this was a lot of fun. I definitely, I, I really enjoyed playing Wallace. And I guess Russia never, you know, unified. But we can kind of tell who's going to win here. But it's been a lot of fun. George Wallace and his whole gamer moves. Now, you wouldn't go extreme gamer. Like, like, really just forcing segregation all the way toward, for everybody, so. But that type of campaign will come someday on this channel, if I, was, if I don't get demonetized. Um, in addition to, like, more, like, early on, full gamer mode, while so we get uh, impeached, so we get Strom Thurmond, I think, as well as just... George Wallace was really nice. But regardless, if you enjoyed the campaign, because I really enjoyed it, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in a different campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.